Giuliano Testa, uh, who you just heard from in his excellent question. Uh, Giuliano is the Surgical Director of Living Donor Liver Transplantation at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. He graduated from the University of Padova Medical School in Italy, completed a fellowship in abdominal organ transplantation at Baylor, additional surgical training in living donor liver transplantation under transplant pioneer Dr. Christoph Grolsch, who many of you may remember who was here uh, for a number of years. Uh, Dr. Testa's research focuses on surgical and transplant e ethics. And, um, and I have to say, you know, a few years ago, Giuliano left the University of Chicago to go to Baylor, where I know he's doing great. But um, it, was, uh, it was sad for those of us who remain here. We lost a great surgeon and a great colleague. So welcome back, Julianne. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure be, being here. Um, this is really one of the things I like to do. Um, when I get the invitation to come here, Mark, it's always, I'm kind of looking forward to it. So I'm very glad to be still part of this group that has influenced a lot of the things I do in surgery. My disclaimer is that um, I do have a, a Adam 1 and Adam 2 personality. So my Adam 2 is the one that I need to perform surgery every day, so I'm on the field. And I work with transplant patients every day, and I've invested practically the past 18 years of my life working in living donation. That's really what I have done. So I'm very biased from that side. The Adam, uh, uh, the other side of Adam is that I, I like to think about these things. And I know it may be seem strange to some of you that a surgeon thinks. I do really, I, I do really take a lot of, of, of pride in thinking that Mark and the McLean Center in general have helped me to get a better understanding of some things. And they also have helped me to frame some of this uh, discourse in a way that may seem a little mundane to some to you, uh, simple. But in reality, you know, surgery is simple. Surg surgery is an act of simplicity uh, in its conception. Uh, that's at least the way I see it. Uh, and so I like to bring things to a very simple, basic uh, um, principle. Um, how do I advance that? As usual, my simplicity uh, is this one. That, that's it. I, I'm so tired of seeing this. I think Mark has presented something this uh, end time. And uh, every time you talk about the organ transplantation, you, you heard from Elisa, you always hear of this. There is no much enough, uh, how much is enough, and the bottom line is that there isn't, there isn't. And after a while, having a surgical personality, you end up saying, okay, if the pus is under the skin, let me cut and get the pus out. Because that's really, you know, bonum and laudabile, I used to say in the old days, and, uh, and that's really what the surgical personality does. Reality seems like that even if we were pushing the disease donor supply to the extreme, we will never be able to fulfill demand. So th that's the reality of what it is. Um, and the problem, and the, at least I had that on the side, I noticed, is that this is from uh, uh, Dr. Rodriguez from uh, Boston, who has an incredible, beautiful project called the House Project, where he goes to the house of the uh, potential patients and tests them about living donation. And, but this is a slide, and uh, he gave it to me, and you see there is declining living donation. Honors, and which is uh, tragic in a certain way. Those are the numbers, by the way. Because in reality, as Mark has been advocating for a while, and being, of course, uh, being my mentor, I really follow him on this, is that if we were really making this living donation work properly, we would have maybe much less problem with a transplant at large and with other, many other issues at large. <coughs> The other incredible part of this conversation is that living donor kidneys work better, and there is no data in the world that will change this. No matter how beautiful the kidney you get from a diseased donor, it will never be as good as a living donor kidney. So there is really a, a, a point there that's strange enough. We are trying to push a lot this marginal donor donation from diseased donors, knowing that we're giving to our patients a product that is not as good as the one we have readily available, which will be the living donor. Uh, the NOT Act was mentioned, of course, we cannot do any valuable exchange for this. So those are the uh, issues, and the children in 1989, so in non-suspected time, I would say, because at that time we were still coming up with many of these issues, were saying that, well, you know, if this donation thing doesn't work, probably it would not be a bad idea to go into a system of retribution. That was said in 1989. 
Now, the big issues that most of the um, uh, opponent to leave donation have is risk to the donor. Even this is becoming a little old. Uh, it's got a lot to do to autonomy, in my opinion. It's got a lot to do with many issues. And uh, the bottom line is this. As somebody who does that uh, every day, I can tell you that if you look at the data on immediate risk for donation, is the same in Japan as it will be in Germany, as it will be in the United States. So we know exactly what we have to tell in terms of informed consent to all our donors when they come to see us. You're going to have X percent risk of having this, X percent risk of having that, because those data are the same no matter what. Where the problem becomes sticky, and I have to say that, for example, the work that Lenny Ross has as ground, is that um, we have a problem with long-term data. Uh, and uh, this is true. Um, in our conference on limit donation, where Mark was gracious enough uh, to come, uh, it was pointed out that the data showed that most of the uh, problems we see in donors will come, will come to surface about seven to 10 years after donation. It's not an immediate problem that you find that the GFR, your, which means your kidney function, if you words, as a donor, will go down immediately. It may continue to go down. And, and this is a huge issue because, of course, how will I know that the donor who donated 10 years ago is now at risk of developing chronic kidney disease if I have no way whatsoever to follow up on this donor? And uh, um, so what do we have thus far is the following. There is this persistent scarcity. Uh, we have to um, uh, acknowledge the fact that there is a great, incredible opportunity of giving perfect kidneys to people who need it. Uh, uh, we know what the immediate risks are. We don't know really, or we know we have limited data on, especially in the United States, by the way, on long-term risk for the donors. Those data are all retrospective and they're all limited. And when I say that, I can prove that to you because whatever you study today is after the fact. So you don't know what would have happened to that particular patient who donated 15 years ago and start to have a creeping up of the blood pressure seven, 10 years later, but nobody has intervened on it. Had somebody intervened on that incremental blood pressure, intervened on that decrement of GFR, probably that patient would not have developed chronic kidney disease. So that's my claim that there is something that could be done about that. And of course, on that, there is a legal problem with reimbursement. How do you put this together? is that we always acknowledge the fact that the moment we say, okay guys, this is not good. We are not going to do living donation or allow a living donation because the risks are such and such and such. Then we have to leave the consequences with that. And if we are all ready to do that, I'm all for it. I don't need to do living donation to make a living. I can continue to do what I do. I'm on a salary, whether I do this or that, doesn't really change my life. And so bottom line is that I can continue to do disease donor transplantation and be fine with that. But then I have to live with the fact that about 6,000 patients a year only in this country will not receive a kidney transplant. And then if that's the case, you read the New York Times articles about a month and a half ago. You see the number of, and why do I say that? I'm certain about that. You see the number of transplanters increasing because that's human nature. Nobody has asked, for example, to the recipient, I would like to see that. If we did a survey of the recipients, all of them, how much would you pay for your kidney? That's the other side of the market. The market is always made by a seller and a buyer. So it would be intriguing to see that most of them say, if I had the money, I would buy any money it would be necessary to me to get the kidney. So people would go out to do this. Um, so there is also a problem with utility, right? Um, we all know that the longer you are in dialysis, uh, the greater is the chance that you're gonna die. So if you are uh, less than 50 years of age, you have diabetes and renal, uh, renal failure, you're on dialysis, you have 20% mortality every year, you're on dialysis. That's a big number. So bottom line, there is a problem with that. And there is a fact that if you get transplanted early, you get off of dialysis, then you have a longer survival, you can go return to the workforce. Uh, there are so many benefits. There is a, a really utilitarian, utilitarian approach to that that should be not forgotten. And of course, for us, the taxpayer, it will translate in a decreased amount of uh, money that we have to give because taking people off dialysis saves money. 
Now, where is the problem? Why I'm getting all this? This seems confusing. I'm trying to wrap it up to what I believe. Years ago, Mark and I, and we wrote an article, and he, he, we say living donors should come first. And of course, many people say this is absolutely not the way you're looking at things, and there was a lot of criticism about that. And Mark pointed out, you know, the problem, Giuliano, is that you cannot do that unless you form some form of incentive by which the donor would be also incentivized to become a donor. And I've been thinking about that, and that's why I really enjoy the talk that uh, Liz gave. Um, and I try to put everything together. Because at the end of the day, there is an hypocrisy in some of what we do. And as somebody who does it, I'm really, I'm culpable of that. I'm, I'm part of this hypocrisy. Um, the donor most of the time is, if is lost a follow-up. So if I lose the donor a follow-up, how I'm gonna find out if the donor will develop something that will be detrimental to his own health after becoming such a great uh, uh, actor in making somebody better? I, I will never know. And so by the same time, you, you will say, what if I found a way to have the donor under control and at the same time, give him something back for what he does. So I would say, that's not my idea, I'm trying to give a justification why, in my opinion, give a lifelong medical coverage to every single donor, independently of uh, how much money makes a year, or whether he's a poor or rich, will be a good way of going around it. Um, in my opinion, we'll do this. We'll kind of uh, address normal efficiency. Uh, no maleficence is the ethical principle that many surgeons, transplant surgeons who are against the living donation use to say that's why we shouldn't be doing it because you're not supposed to operate on people who are healthy and they don't need the operation per se. But you know, if uh, you are reinforcing your missing data, all of a sudden you make an argument to say no, I know exactly what is gonna happen. So you reinforce your informed consent because my way of fighting or counteracting no maleficence is that I give informed consent. So I empower autonomy, the donor, to make a decision regarding what is gonna happen to him. And since I have a missing data, which is the long-term effect, if I have a way of getting the donor coming back to me for life, I will have data to tell to the other potential donor, come to me because I know exactly not only what is gonna to happen to you in the short term, but also what is gonna to happen to you 25 years from now. And we will be able as a community to say, if you are 35, you have this characteristic, you are not gonna be a donor, period, end of discussion. I think it's gonna be much more robust um, data to the people who, like me, think that living donation is a good thing. It would enhance beneficence. And what I say with that is that, what I do if I can follow you for life, the moment, as I said, that you go and gain 15 pounds, I'm gonna say, nah, no, man, you almost kind of sign a, a, a contract with me by which I'm giving you lifelong medical coverage. Now you're gonna go into some prophylactic measures that allows me to control your weight, allows me to control your blood pressure, allows me to control some other lifestyle modification that needs to be done so that you remain healthy for life. So I think that, in my opinion, has some benefit. And this is justice. Because, you know, let's face it. Um, this thank you note that we give to the donors is becoming a little old. <laughs> no, a donation, words are powerful. We have always framed this thing about donation, but you know, there is a point in which you keep donating, you expect something back. You know, even when you donate your name to the University of Chicago, you expect something back because you want to have your name up there and people can see from a distance. So we, we need to be a little honest about this and I think justice is important in this. Let's have some form of fair trade in a certain way. Let's call it fair trade when we talk about these issues. And there is of course a moderate utility because if you think about the way that Obamacare has been, for example, sold to us, to all of us, is that you need to have, and that's true for any insurance industry, the insurance industry survives for the simple reason that there are people who pay premium and you don't, they don't use it. Because if everybody who pays the premium will require incredible medical care, either the insurance industry goes bankrupt or the premium will be unbelievably high. So, who are the living donors? The living donors are healthy people by definition. So it would be a really smart business choice 
that I enroll as many healthy people I can in my health plan because they know they're, gonna, they're not going to use it. And the only thing they're going to have for them is following up for life with checkups and if something happens, give a little intervention and avoid them for going in renal dialysis, which would be a very costly intervention. So I see a big benefit in that, very smart in a certain way, way of using the utilitarian approach. There are other things that go into these things. I'm not going to go into it because I'm on time and I want to leave, hopefully, some, some questions with that. Uh, the, uh, there are many things that we can see about the reward for doing uh, something risky should be there anyhow. There is a lot of autonomy and entitlement of the body part that we should respect when enter a large the conversation regarding reimbursement or giving something back to the donors. And then, <coughs> This commodification of the human body, I find that a little bit um, academic because in reality it's a commodification no matter what you, what you say, it, in my opinion. But uh, this is really a sticky point. Uh, I come, now I became a Texan, I, I say, and uh, it's 26 million people. And interestingly enough, 39% of the population in Texas, if needed a transplant today, would not qualify. 39%. It's a huge number. So the other point is that the same 39% will not qualify to receive a kidney, a heart, a liver, or a pancreas. It's perfectly okay to donate it. <laughs> perfectly. We will never question, oh, do you have money to donate? No. We go there and we take their organs. So we need to be a little bit more, um, how do I say this in, a, in a, a nice way, less hypocritical about this, a, a, a little more honest about this. And then I like, again, children, I, I, I read some of the stuff that they, I like what they say, where is the difference between buying an organ and buying the procedure to get an organ? It, there is a lot of death into this uh, kind of uh, uh, um, uh, sentence. So in conclusion, why do I think giving medical coverage lifelong to the donor is ethically correct? Because of the reasons that, in the principle, in a very simple way, I agree. I try to bring down to uh, general comprehension. Uh, is definitely financially sound. I think I give you an idea of that. Of course, there is a lot of issues. Of all the, like one, the, one of the hypocritical way that the hospital decided not to cover for lifelong covering is that it cost money. Honestly, it costs very little to have somebody coming to you giving a CBC and a, and a CMP and maybe a GFR calculated uh, one and once a year. Come on, it's a joke in comparison of what it costs to keep somebody on dialysis or other intervention that we do. It will allow better donor selection for the reason that I told you. Uh, we will have healthier donors for life because we can do intervention if something happens and I think there will be less uh, patients on dialysis. That's my daughter. Thank you so much. And she raises hand. If you have questions, please ask them. Thank you. No question. I'm, I'm lucky. No questions. I find that hard to believe. Dan is on his way. You know, I wasn't going to, but. So, Juliana, I love your idea about following patients, you know, scrupulously after they transplant. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful idea. And perhaps maybe we should just do that for everybody, you know, just take care of the patients and, and um, follow them scrupulously. Because I think we could do that in this country. No, hold on a second. <laughs> Well, but that, that's, that's a nice thing. There is a guy here that, at the business school, Taylor. He wrote this book, is Nudge. People don't do things unless you find a way of uh, kind of pushing them to do things. Tell them they have to do it. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. 50% of the people who don't need a kidney don't come back at the two year follow up. So the bottom line is you have to find a way of making sure that these donors have an incentive to come back. And I the think way if we made it the, easier way, for people to know come from back. And Knetman that wrote the, the book was mentioned yesterday, Things Fast and Things Slow, it hurts when they take something away from you. So if you give them the lifelong medical coverage and they give them as part of their, you know, whatever is out of the monthly expenses, and then you say, if you don't show up, I'm going to take this away. All of a sudden, people are nudged to do something good for mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. and enlarge for the community. That's at least my opinion. Okay. 
Okay, we've got lots of people up to ask questions, so make them short, please. Sure. Uh, Dr. Tessa, your first slide about how the rate of directed altruistic donation is going down, I think is more shocking than the fact that the wait list is going up. So there's more demand, more people's family members are going into renal failure, but less people are donating in light of that increased demand. What do you think is the, a possible explanation for this failure of the altruistic donated, uh, directed donation system? Um, I think part of it is that, as it was pointed out today, uh, we, it's good to talk about this in a conference where everybody is very comfortable, but I live with donors every day, and a kidney donor practically loses a month of, uh, of work by, after donation. A liver donor takes about two months to recover and be able to go back to work. There is a role of harters to, to donation that we practically do nothing. It's like when you, you're pregnant. We all say, oh, the family is a great thing. We all we do everything for the family. And then the surgical residence got three weeks and has got to go back to work. So words are beautiful. Facts in life hurt. <laughs> That's why. Uh, Herb Stone, I'm a urologist. I thank you for your excellent presentation. Question I ask is that everybody should be asking these questions. Who pays for this? Um, is it the person that receives the organ, the government, or, or philanthropic organizations? And I think it would be, I like the idea, but I think it would be a good idea to put an addendum down there and to find out how to pay for it, because this is almost like an annuity, a lifetime annuity. And uh, yeah. it is costly, regardless of what people may think. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's a, in, in any business, you have to look at what is more costly and what at the end of the day the, your bottom line will look like. And it's much more costly to have people on dialysis than transplanting these people, number one. Number two is also the fact that the hypocrisy of the insurance industry on donation is, is, uh, is, is universal that if a donor of mine has a keloid and there's 5,000 deductible in insurance plan and the recipient dies so the, the recipient insurance cannot pay for that complication, that donor doesn't know where to go. So I think that everybody should put something in the game. The insurance companies, because they benefit from having people transplanted, and the government at large, because they benefit from having people going off dialysis. So a solution can be found. It's just a matter of finding a common ground where you can initiate this conversation. Thank you. Wait. Giuliano, thank you. I actually want to agree with you. And no way. Like, it's impossible. <laughs> but there's always a but. So I want to agree with you that all donors should get lifetime health insurance. I actually want to argue that everybody should have lifetime health insurance. Yeah. You just told me how expensive dialysis is. Wouldn't it be really important to do prevention so that we'd have less hypertension, less diabetes that leads to the dialysis and that leads to the chronic renal failure that needs dialysis in the first place? I, I agree. Look, I agree, Andrew, but that's a, that's a pro, it's a, this is a larger problem. If we had more time, I would ask you how come we list so many people for transplantation in this country when it, and if your ratio with population is the greater number on list of the entire world because, you know, we list everybody and there is no control for that. But try to tell people in a larger conversation, of course, that it's not probably the best idea to transplant somebody who's an 80 year old there's going to be a, a riot for this. So there are so many issues in this transplant larger that touch upon prevention, who gets the, how we do this. I agree 100%, but my talk was about donations, so I have to, <laughs> to get there. But donations is only necessary because we didn't start with prevention. Yeah, uh, and, and you know the chronic, chronic disease is increasing. I mean, uh, this is not something that's going to end tomorrow, unfortunately. It's not like hepatitis C, or which we will see probably an end in 20 years. It doesn't work this way. Todd, last question. Um, so I have a question about, we, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about incentivizing the living, and I've, I've always been curious if there's been any thought about incentivizing the dead, um, and that if, if patients were eligible to donate all organs, this, is, this would also help in, in 
hearts and lungs, that if there's any thought for incentivizing the patients that have already died, paying their families or paying for funeral arrangements or paying for having some sort of incentive for those that have died, do you think that one, that would increase the, the number of organs enough that it could be beneficial? And two, is there less risk of exploitation, especially from a socioeconomic perspective, if you're incentivizing, incentivizing the person that has already died? So, the, 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 yeah, there's been, there's a try to, to, to pay for, for that, to reimburse for that. If you ask me, I would be full in favor, absolutely. And if you ask me why in certain areas the, the donation rate from disease is still 50%, it doesn't go higher than that, it's because people are getting tired. Everybody knows there is an industry behind this. And come on, let's be, let's, let's be a little more honest about that. So if you tell me I'm gonna give you an incentive for a funeral, I would do, what's wrong about that? I really don't see anything wrong with that, and it would be in favor of that, and it would decrease the need, absolutely. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.